That's exactly what we're going to be talking about this morning. On this continuation, on the series on the sins of the saints, we're going to talk about soul winning today. Soul winning. Everybody say soul winning. Soul winning winning is a very important part of the church's life. If you're not a soul winner, shame on you. You ought to be. You ought to be a soul winner. Why? Because Jesus Christ commands you to be a soul winner. He told you to go out into the fields and look upon the fields. They are white. And you're to pray for the Lord of the harvest to bring in laborers. Because there's plenty to do, but few willing to do it. Amen. And in this little church, we believe in soul winning. And in this little church, we practice it. We do street preaching. We... um, get out there into prisons, we do what we can for the Lord, we do uh, evangelistic work on different um, levels, Uh, we've got YouTube ministries, we've got a website, We, we do everything we can possibly think of to do to get people to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to show you a verse this morning as we start this thing in Proverbs chapter 11 verse 30, so go ahead and get there and turn there. And I want to read something to you that the Lord gave me that I want to share with you. And I want, to, I want you to listen to me carefully now. I want you to think about what I'm saying. Everybody listening? Alright, listen to me very carefully because this is profound. <laughs> the moment that you become useless to the Lord, you will die. Think about that. The moment that you, me, become useless to the Lord, you will die. He'll bring you home to glory. So what does that say? That says this. The reason you're here is because there's unfinished business that you have with the Lord. Are you listening? Is everybody listening? All the way to the back. Listen to me carefully. If you become useless to the Lord, the moment you become useless, that's the end of the road. Then the Lord calls you home. The reason that God does not call you home after you first get saved is because He's got something He wants you to do. You understand what I'm saying? Now, sometimes... God gives Christians a reminder of that. And sometimes they will have close calls with death to remind them, hey, I can call you home just like that. Now, what are you going to do for me? I let you stay here for a purpose. I do not let you stay here so you can sit around and spend all your time on TV and YouTube and watching Slump and and entertaining yourself. God's, your, your entertaining of yourself is not God's business. God's business is you become a useful vessel that God can use to win other people to Jesus Christ. You being entertained is irrelevant. Okay? Now, I didn't say that it's wrong to be entertained. I like entertainment. I like to go out and do things. I like to do recreational things. But the problem becomes we take that to a level to where we neglect God and put ourselves above and before Him. To where we, we put Him on a back burner and if it's convenient, we'll bring Him into the equation. If it's not convenient, we'll just keep Him on the back burner somewhere and we'll pull Him out when we're ready for Him. And God's getting sick of that. If you want me to be frank with you about churches and Christians and, and the, in the last days. Alright. Another thing that needs to be stated is no matter what condition you are in, you can do something for the Lord. Now let's park it there for a second, shall we? Let me read that one more time. No matter what condition you are in, you can do something for the Lord. You say, well, I'm crippled. I don't care if you're crippled or not. You can do something for Jesus Christ. You know Fanny Crosby? You ever heard that name? 
She wrote some of the greatest hymns in your hymn book. Amen. Go look them up sometime. Go look up some of these verses. You know that song, I was uh, blind, but now I see? Fanny Crosby. Okay? You know what? unique about Fanny Crosby she was completely blind think about that she was blind and yet she did something for the Lord that has had an impact on the church for years I don't care if you're in a wheelchair I don't care if you're immobile I don't care if you're a paraplegic you can do something for Jesus Christ you can do something. You may not do what the preacher can do. You may not can do what this person over here can do. You can do something. Listen to me. I don't care how healthy or unhealthy you are. I don't care how fat or skinny you are. I don't care if you've got high blood pressure till it goes out the roof. I don't care if your cholesterol levels are out the roof to where the doctor gets nervous. You can do something for Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Brother Ruckman, I use him as an example many times because he was much he was a big inspiration to me. He was out there on the street corner of Palafox four months before he gave, got his last breath street preaching on the corner of that street out there preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the passersby. Four months before he died. Well it came. He can do something for Jesus Christ. He understood that. He pr his prayer was, Lord, when I lose my sight, take me home. Guess what? When he got to the place where he couldn't read his Bible, he was ready to go home. And guess what? The Lord honored that request. The moment he became blind, he died. Now think about that. I don't care if you're sick. I don't care if you're diseased. I don't care if the skin is dripping off your body. <laughs> crippled or fit as, as you can be, you can do something for Jesus Christ. How many of you have read the book Tortured for Christ by Richard Rumbrock? How many of you have heard of it? You have never heard of the book Tortured for Christ? Okay. I'm going to get that book and I'm going to get some copies of that book. They're free. They're put out by the voice of the martyrs. I want you to get that book. When I get it to you, I want you to take some time and read it. It's not very big. It won't take you but about half a day to read it. But... Let me tell you something. He was in a concentration camp in Russia. He was tortured for 14 hours a day. He was sleep deprived. He was uh, in a cell, isolated from everybody and everything. And the only thing that kept him sane was thinking about the scriptures he had learned when he was free. And he meditated on those verses. And he prayed. And he sang hymns to God. What was he doing? He was doing something for the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't have nobody around him to witness to except the guards when they came in. And when I say they tortured that man, let me tell you something. They tortured him, brother. They tortured him in ways that you wouldn't believe. Shock treatment and everything else. Trying to get him to renounce his faith in Christ. Now notice in all of this that I'm talking about this morning, I didn't say you were doing it. There's a difference. I said there is something you can do. So what is it, preacher? I don't know. Everybody's different in this building. But everybody in this building has talent. God has given you something that you can do for the Lord. And the Bible tells you that whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Okay? Whatever you do. And there's things that you have talents in that this young man may have a different talent. This lady right here has certain talents that this man back here has a different talent of. And this sister right here has got a talent that this young man here doesn't have a talent, but he's got another talent. And when we all come together and figure out what our talents are in the local church and we do those things that God has called us to do and use those talents for the glory of God in the local church, the church will prosper, the church will grow, the church will become the entity that God wants it to be in the community. Bottom line. And that's why we're talking about this subject this morning. The issue, though, here's the issue. 
Now listen to me on this one too. I want you to pay attention. The issue that determines whether you will or won't do it is a simple word. You know what it is? Love. If you love Jesus Christ, you will do it. If you don't love Jesus Christ, you will not do it. I don't care what happens in this pulpit. I can preach to my till, till I'm blue in the face. And if you don't love Jesus Christ, you will not do what God wants you to do. No matter what I beg you, I can plead, I can get on my knees, I can cry, I can, I can go to your house, I can eat supper with you, I can go out to the restaurants with you, I can do everything I can, I can motivate you, I can pray for you, I can get before God and travail. And we, but let me tell you something, at the end of the day, what determines whether a man or a woman will do what God told them to do is love. And you've got to love Jesus Christ with all your heart, and if you love Him, you'll do what He says to do. That's it. That's it. It's simple. If you love Him, you'll do what He tells you to do. If you don't, then all bets are off. That's the real issue this morning we're talking about. Now look at Proverbs chapter 11. The fruit of the righteous is what? Now, I've read that verse a bunch over the years. I preached out of that verse. I've been in conferences where I preach revivals and I preach this verse. I preached it on street corners. I preached it in pulpits across uh, this state and other states. But there's something about this verse I was reading it the other day that I noticed that I hadn't noticed this, all these times I preached. It says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. What's your Bible made out of? A tree. You know what makes it a tree of life? The words of God being on it. That thing becomes a tree of life by the words of God being on it. And you know what that says? The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. The fruit that a Christian produces comes out of the word of God. You cannot produce fruit unless you put this book in its proper place. And I don't mean just running around and telling people you believe the Bible. The devils know that the Bible is true. The devils believe the Bible. The devils believe God. They believe, they, they believe there is a God. That does not make you right with God. And that does not make you in a position to where you're doing what God wants you to do. The key factor, folks, in producing fruit is not only recognizing that the Word of God is where we get our fruit and where we get our uh, motivation, <clears throat> but it is practicing and putting into practice what God's Word says for us to do. Now look at the next part of this verse. The next part of this verse says what? It says, And he that wins souls is what? I wonder how many wise Christians we've got in America today. Not that many. <laughs> Not that many. You know what they determine a person being wise? How much education you got? Where did you go to school at, preacher? What university did you graduate from? What kind of PhD do you have? What kind of uh, bachelor's degree? What kind of associate's degree do you have? They determine people's wisdom by their education and God determines their wisdom by how many souls they've won to Jesus Christ. Now, if everybody, I want you to look around. I want everybody to take a moment and I want you to look around in this church for a minute. Just get a good feel of how many people are in this church this morning. Just kind of look around. Just, just look at each other. Now, you got a good feel about how many is here, right? Now, I want you to think about something. If everybody in this church made it their business this week, Brother Chuck, just to win one person to Jesus Christ and get them in church, what would happen next week in this church? We'd be scrunched together. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And then at the following week, all those people just want one person to Jesus Christ. Just focus on, I'm going to win one person to Jesus Christ this week. What would happen the following week? You see what I mean? That's how the church grows. The church doesn't grow by having pizza parties. I like pizza. Don't you young men like pizza? I like pizza. 
I like pizza, but let me tell you something. Pizza is not so winning. It may be a tool you can use to get them to where you can preach to them. I'm not disputing that. But what I'm saying is, we got to get back to the basics of what the Bible says we are to be doing. The Bible says, he that wins souls is wise. He that wins souls is wise. Now look up here on this board this morning. Soul winning. I'm going to go through some of this. this and this, this is going to be a few, few services. So I want you to look up here for a minute. <clears throat> and, and pay attention to what I'm um, going to read off to you this morning. Because I know there's a glare. And I apologize for that. But I'm going to read it to you. I want to show everybody in this church the following things. Know how to lead someone to Jesus Christ. That's number one. I want you to learn the Romans road if you don't know it already. I want to show you what the Great Commission says. And I want you to understand that the Great Commission is not a suggestion. It is a commandment. I want you to take advantage of some things here and go out and do some things. What do I want you to do? I want you to pay attention to these community boards. Almost every restaurant that y'all go to has a community board. Do you have tracks with the church's address on it? Do you have church cards? I've got plenty of church cards. I can give you all the church cards you want. Why don't you stick them on those community boards? Give out the CDs that we have back there. People that want to find out a little bit about our church, but they're a little reluctant to come, they're not, not sure about the preaching, give them some of the preaching stuff and let them hear what we're doing. Let me tell you something about that officer last night that I was uh, at the prison preaching. You know what that lady said? She said, I ain't had strong preaching like that since I was a kid. My church I went to when I was a kid had that kind of preaching, and I've not heard that kind of preaching since. And it was motivational her because you know what she said? Every church I'm going to, they sugarcoat, they water down, and it's all positive, and there's nothing biblical, and there's nothing strong meat, there's no doctrine. This is a woman that ain't going to church, and she said that in response to me preaching last night. Now, if I had done what some people suggest I do in my preaching service and tone it down a little bit, and just be more positive and more loving and more caring and sharing and coping and hoping and make the world a better place to live in. Well, I'm going to do that. I want Jesus Christ to blow it up. And that will make it a better place. Okay? You know what they need to do over there in the Middle East? They need to make Gaza and they need to make Iran and Iraq a parking lot. And that will make the world a better place to live in. If they take some nuclear bombs and blow Russia up, that would make the world a better place to live in. That's the kind of preacher I am. Uh, dialogue does not work in case you haven't noticed because the man that hates your guts is sitting at the table with you dialoguing with you is plotting how he can kill you now that's the world we live in and you better re recognize real quick that we live in a world where people hate us and our job is to get the gospel of Jesus Christ in their hearts so that their minds will change by their heart being converted to Christ then they'll be on the same page we are until then all bets are off so you better preach as hard as you can and tell them as hard as you can and let them know what the Word of God says about their condition. When I got in that prison last night and preached to those men, I told them this from the pulpit. The first thing I told those men was, I said, let me tell you something. Some of you in here, this message I'm going to be preaching on, I was preaching on the judgment seat of Christ, it don't apply to you. So tune out. I said, why do you say that, preacher? I said that because there's some people in there that's lost. You know what I told those lost people when I, I, I prefaced that on this? I said, some of you are going to hell like a bullet. And until you get saved, you won't be able to get to the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to bypass that and go to the great white throne judgment. And you're going to go to hell and you're going to burn forever. Does that bother you? Now that woke some people up in there. Then I got their attention. I didn't do this little smooth talking Joel Osteen stuff <coughs> where I said, well... God loves you. And, and we're all in one big family here tonight. And I'm just so glad y'all came here to hear the words of God. And I'm just so glad that you're here tonight. And you chose me to hear as your preacher. And I hope that I don't disappoint you. <laughs> Take that man and throw him out of the church, okay? 
Get a man in there that's got some guts and backbone and tell you the truth and not sugarcoat it and let you know what God's really thinking. God's angry with you. He's going to stay angry with you. You're going to go to hell like a bullet until you get saved. That's where you're headed. And then I preach the soul winning message and two men got saved. And when I say they got saved, Brother Chuck, let me tell you something. That man, one of those men came trembling and weeping and crying. He was bawling before he ever got to the front. Now we need to see that in the churches again. You know what I saw in that church last night? I saw saints of God in there that were shaken up and crying and weeping in their pews. Save people. Getting a burden for lost people. Getting a burden about doing something for Jesus Christ. Instead of sitting there like a knot on a log, staring at people, thinking, oh, oh, oh I just wish you shut his mouth and so I can go back to life as usual. <laughs> oh, no. Not this church, baby. This church, I'm going to keep you stirred up from the time you get in here to the time you leave. Don't you forget it. If you're comfortable in here, you're, something's wrong. I must be sick. Because <laughs> I want you stirred up so when you walk out that door, you'll do something for the Lord. Amen. Now watch. We need to put up Scripture signs in our yards. That's biblical. Did you know, how many of you know that's biblical? Nobody knew that was biblical? Alright. I'm glad you didn't raise your hand. Because I get a chance to teach you something. Alright, let's go over here to um, Deuteronomy, I think it is. Give me just a minute, let me find it. Alright, let's see. Uh, hold on just a minute. Give me just a minute. I want. I want. You got to see this. There is a biblical precedent for putting scripture signs out in your yard. Go to Deuteronomy chapter six, verse nine. I showed this to a Christian one time, and you would not believe the answer I got back from him when I showed him. <clears throat> you know what their response to me was? I don't want to litter my yard with that trash. It'll clutter up my yard. What would the neighbors think? You better worry about what God thinks, sweetheart. When you're burning in hell. <laughs> Look at this one. Thou shalt write them upon the post of thy what? We do that. We got a little scroll that's hanging outside the church there. And we got a scroll that's hanging on our barns over there. We got a scroll on our house with the scripture in it. It's Deuteronomy 6, 4. Alright. And what else does he say? And on thy what? There it is. That's where you enter into the home at. That's where you pull in the parking lot. I don't say you have to go uh, like I'm doing out there where I got it all along the fence line, but put a scripture sign out of your yard. Let people know where you stand. Let them know that you're saved. Let them know that you love Jesus Christ. Get you a few and then change them out every once in a while. You'd be surprised at how many. You know how many people we have out here? Now, I get all kinds of responses. You understand? Out here. Y'all want to know why some of these gate posts, uh, these uh, wooden posts out here are broken down? It's not because they're uh, rotten and falling off. It's because some people, when they drive by, they throw beer bottles and liquor bottles at the fence and they bust the fence open. You get that response from people. Okay? It brings out the best in people. <laughs> okay? It'll let you know what's in their heart. But there's other people, when they ride by here, They'll slow down, they'll stop, and they'll take pictures all along the line. Have we, how many times have we seen that, Gary? A bunch of times, day and night. I've had some pull into the driveway and uh, say, I appreciate what you're doing. I said, what am I doing? <laughs> and, they, and they point out there to the Scripture signs. 
They're reading those signs. And it's getting their attention. Alright, you're supposed to put them on your post. Now, next thing I got up here is witnessing to others is vital to the life of the local church. I said that a few minutes ago. Invitations. Can you invite people to church? You got room in your car, don't you? Why don't you bring them to church? Especially your neighbors. Invite them to church. If you don't know what to say to them, trust me, I do. Get them here and let them sit under the preaching of the Word of God, Sister Cassie, and, and they'll know what's going on in a few minutes. <laughs> Some people are scared to bring people here. <laughs> I don't know why, but they are. Door knocking. I knew a preacher one time and another saint that won a preacher. He put ten little small rocks in this pocket, brother. Chuck. And before he went home, every day, he had those rocks in this pocket. And he was asked about that. He said, what, what's the story on the rocks in the pocket? He said, well... I made a commitment to God that when I get up in the morning and I go throughout my day, I'm going to witness to somebody about Jesus Christ at least 10 people a day. And I take a rock and I move it to this pocket every time I witness to somebody. And I don't go home until I've talked to 10 people about Jesus Christ. That's pretty good. That's profound. Door knocking. How about passing tracts out? Passing church cards out? You know, every one of these church cards, by the way, I don't know if you know it or not, or, or took time to look at it, has the plan of salvation on the back of it. It's not just the information on the church. It's upside down. Like that. But it's got the plan of salvation on the back. You give them this card, you give them the plan of salvation to read, and trust me, they'll flip it. I've watched them do it. I've given them church cards. Brother Chuck, and I've watched them do this. Flip. And read it. Alright. Passing out tracks. How about street preaching? We do that here. We get on the corner and make a fool out of ourselves for the Lord. We become fools for Christ. Okay? How about calling folks? Listen, ladies. I don't know how to say this nice without just saying it. Instead of getting on the phone and gossiping about everybody and talking about your neighbors and talking about this one and talking about that one, why don't you get on the phone and invite people to come to church? You know they're not going to get excited about church unless you are. Amen. You want to get this preacher excited and motivated and positive? (laughs) Why don't you get this church full of people that you've invited, boy? I'll have a field day in here. And get people let one to Christ and get this thing going and get this building over here built quicker than what we're already planning on getting it built. Boy, we can have us a time out here. Amen. If I have to make this whole yard a parking lot, I will. Amen. That's how committed I am. You know why? Because when God gave us this place, let me tell you something. I made a commitment to God. I'm going to use this for your glory. I'm in it. Take your Bible and go to Romans. Romans chapter 1. And then Acts chapter 1. Two places. Now we're going to preach a little while. So winning. Is it important? Well, we'll see. What did Paul say? Romans chapter 1, verse 13. Now, I, I advise you to take a picture of this up here so you can have some ideas. I gave you a bunch of ideas up here on what you can do. Somebody said, I don't know what to do. I just gave you a bunch of ideas. There's plenty more where that came from. But there's some things to get you started right there. When you're in a restaurant, you're sitting down eating, lay a track down. When you throw that drive through, pass in one of those chick tracks. I've got plenty. I'll get more if I need to. Romans chapter 1, look at verse 13. The Bible says this. Now, I would not have you ignorant. All right. 
I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oft times I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto. And I might have some fruit, there's that word fruit, among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as is in me is, I am ready to do what? <clears throat> to preach the gospel. Let me tell you something. People don't like preaching <clears throat> anymore. They don't like uh, going to churches where the man of God gets up and actually preaches a sermon and actually gets in there and spits and sweats and slings his uh, words around and slings his hands around. They get nervous about that and they say, that's all that old okay stuff, you know, that backwoods preaching stuff. I want an educated, smooth, talking man that will lie to me and send me straight to hell. Amen. That's what the world's looking for today. But the Bible has one method to get the gospel out to people, and that's preaching to them and proclaiming what God said to them. The Bible says, I am uh, ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Anybody know what Rome is? That was a cesspool of iniquity. That was the seedbed where everything and anything went. I mean, you could see any kind of wickedness and vile thing that you could imagine out of your wicked heart and you could come up with some things that your mind couldn't even think of that was going on in Rome. America today is in that same category. She's headed down that same road. All roads lead to, long, all roads lead to Rome. <laughs> and um, I'll tell you something interesting last night, Brother Chuck. I shared my vision last night that I told people, I said, let me tell you something that's going to happen. You better get ready. Now, I'm going to tell this church this morning the same thing. If you're going to do anything for Jesus Christ, you better do it now. We are about to jump off this wagon and go straight up in the air. If you've got some loved ones that you're trying to get saved, you better get busy trying to get them saved now. We're getting ready to leave this earth. And the rapture is upon us. Now you may not believe that, but I'm telling you something. I shared something with those men last night that I've shared in this church about a vision I had where I saw me and my wife were standing out on a side road um, there and uh, all of a sudden I heard this trumpet going off. And it wasn't a trumpet like, da -da 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 -da, Brother Shane, it wasn't like that. It was a ram's horn. And, and as it went out, it went louder and louder and louder. It was a ram's horn, which is exactly what they used in the Old Testament to call an assembly. And it went, and as that thing went off, I felt myself coming up off the ground. And I looked at my wife, I said, this is it. This is it. We're going up. This is it. And all of a sudden I heard, Come up hither. Just like that. And up we started going. And I looked back at the United States as I'm going. And I saw the bombs hitting the ground. All over the United States. Nuclear bombs. Boom, 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 boom. I said, my God, all these people, they're lost. I got a guy last night that stood up in the church when I said that. He said, Preacher, i got to say this. I said, Say it, brother. What you got to say? He said, I had the same dream. God gave me the same vision. I saw the bombs going off as we were going up in the air. Another guy said, I saw the same thing. God is warning people what's about to happen. He is telling the church, get your act together and get yourself ready. We're getting ready to go. Amen. Now that ought to be exciting to you that are ready. Amen. It ought to make some of you nervous because you ain't ready. And some of you are going to go up to the judgment seat of Christ with a red face. Because you've wasted your time on this earth doing stupid, foolish things while neglecting the things of God that God called you to do. Listen to me. He says in verse 16, I am not ashamed of what? Are you ashamed? 
Are you ashamed to be reckoned with Him? Are you ashamed to be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ when it comes down to it and the pressure comes on? Let me tell you something. If the Chinese and the Russians, they're getting ready, by the way. They got them off the coast of Alaska right now, in case you didn't know. They got ships off the coast of Alaska that our warships have met them to try to intercept them. This dumb government that we've got has got four ships to their 12 that's meeting them, thinking that we can do something to them. Let me tell you something. It's getting ready to be on. They've got them lined up off the coast of Alaska. They've got training camps up in Canada ready to come down. they got training camps down in Mexico ready to come up. And let me tell you something. This thing is about to go off and the church is about to go up and we better be ready and we better be doing something for Jesus Christ before it's too late. That's what is going on. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. If they come into your house right now, I dare say, some Christians today, if they came into their house and said, hey, uh, give me your Bibles. Oh, yes, sir. Over my dead body, buddy, you'll have to put a bullet in my head to get it out of my hands. Comrade Harris, Amen. Put that on TV, uh, YouTube and see how go, how far it goes. <laughs> I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation of everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Soul winning. So I can't do anything. I, I, I had a lady tell me one time when I was telling her, you need to be out there so winning for the Lord. You know what she told me? Typical of Laodicean Christian attitudes. Laodicean Christians don't do anything unless they feel like it. They're moved by their feelings, not by the command of Jesus Christ. So she told me, I don't go and do that kind of stuff unless I feel led. Well, let me tell you something stupid. The Holy Spirit has led you into Scriptures and told you to do it. And if you don't do it, you're disobedient to God. You don't have to wait for a feeling. You don't have to be, feel a, a, a tingling feeling to get you out there to do something. Do something and God will give you a feeling. Amen. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says this. Actually, actually, verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And when they therefore will come together, they ask of him, saying, Lord, without this time restore again the kingdom to Israel. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Look at verse 8. But ye shall receive what? Power. Say it again. Power. One more time. Power. power. You want some power? <laughs> After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and what happens after that comes upon you? What are you going to do? You shall be what? Witness. Say it one more time. Witness. Real loud. Witness. You're called to be a witness for Jesus Christ. You tell me you got the Holy Ghost and you don't open your mouth to talk about Jesus Christ? You lying devil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You talk about how much you love Jesus Christ, and you talk about how much you're uh, in love with the Lord, but you don't never do anything for Him. You don't witness for Him. You don't open your mouth. Let me tell you something. You go up to Jesus Christ, it will come out your mouth, and you'll tell people about the Lord. Amen. Amen. You'll receive power. You won't be timid. Peter was timid. When Jesus was arrested, why? Because he didn't have the Holy Ghost. So he denied him. Like a lot of Christians do today. But the moment he got the Holy Ghost, you couldn't shut him up. You see the difference? Without the Holy Ghost, he denies him. I don't know the man. I ain't ever seen him. I don't blankety blank know him. They use profanity, by the way in their speech when they're talking about not knowing Him. But the moment He gets the power of God in His life, He says, Hey, it's better to obey God rather than men, and bless your heart, I'm willing to die for Him, and I'm going to the, 
I'm going to the cross, and when you nail me, by the way, P.S., hang me upside down because I'm not worthy to be hung the same way he was. That's Peter. History bears that out. When they crucified Peter over there, they flipped his cross upside down because he said to the Roman soldiers that were nailing him, don't hang me like Jesus Christ. I'm not worthy to be hung like Him. Flip me upside down. They said, we'll accommodate. Flip. That's in Fox's Book of Martyrs. That's in uh, the Martyr's Mirror and uh, other reliable work works written by the Waldensians and Abigensians that have records that go all the way back to the apostles that record that, that happening. He says, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Go to Ezekiel chapter 3. This is where we're going to close. Ezekiel chapter 3. I've got to close. And we'll pick this up next week. Now, I want to motivate you this morning. Now, i got to stir you up to motivate you. Now, if you've not been doing what you're supposed to be doing, make a commitment today to do it. Start doing it, okay? Make a commitment. You know what? The preacher's right. I need to get busy doing something for Christ. I need to get stirred up. I need to get in the altar. I need to pray for some power. I need to pray for some uh, boldness. And I need God to help me to get out there and, and focus on people that I know that are lost. And I need to get them in church. I need to get them saved. I need to get them one to Christ. Because the Lord's about to come. Alright, verse 17. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17. Watch what he says here. I want you to pay attention now. In case you think I'm missing the mark, I'm telling you, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, if you're not witnessing to your lost loved ones and they die lost, God is going to hold you responsible for them. Look at verse 17. Son of man, I have made thee a what? A watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning for me. <clears throat> when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but, what does that next part say? See, I didn't make that up. I'm in the book. I'm still in the book. The book says, if you don't want him, his blood, am I going to require your hand? So it's, it, it would behoove us to get out there and say, hey, you need to get right with God. Yet if thou warn the wicked and he turn from not from his wickedness nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered what? You've done your part. All you got to do is tell them one time. If they shut you off after that one time, it's on them then. That's why I say it's important to give a track to everybody you meet even in passing, because you never know that one track may be the only opportunity, the only time they hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you would be responsible for getting them saved if they get saved, and you will relieve yourself if they reject it. Isn't that interesting? Now that's the gospel in action. So winning is so important that God said to every born again believer in Matthew, go into all the world. And do what? Preach. You say women can preach? You better believe it. <laughs> the word preach means to proclaim. Now, I didn't say they'd be behind a pulpit. But there's different ways of proclaiming the gospel. The first person that went and told the apostles about the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a woman. Was she preaching? She was proclaiming something. The Lord is risen indeed. Is that proclaiming? Opening your mouth and saying Jesus Christ is risen is proclaiming. Everybody in this building is called to be a soul winner for Jesus Christ. Every one of you. I don't care who you are. I don't care how good you are, how well off you are, how poor you are, how healthy you are, or how unhealthy you are. You're called to do something for Jesus Christ. You know how I know that? Because you're still alive. When God gets done with you, 
You'll take your last breath and go on to be with the Lord. And God said, all right, now take some rest. Until then, you've got something you better get busy doing. Amen. That's my burden this morning, folks. Now, we'll get into this some more next week on the gospel and soul winning. And I want to, I got plenty to say on this. I got plenty to say. This is just the beginning. But I want you to hear me. Get a burden for the lost. Get a burden for your lost loved ones. Get in these altars before church. Get, get in here 30 minutes before church and start praying. Get down beside your bed at night time and pray for your lost loved ones. Let me tell you something. We that have children in here, listen to me. Everybody here has got children and grandchildren. You better take time to, to plant the Word of God in them. You better show them how to pray by praying in front of them. You better pray with them. Plant those seeds. If you don't, the devil will. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank You for Your blessings this morning. Thank You for this message. Thank You for the people that are here hungry to hear from You. I tried this morning to get this thing started and this introduction given. Lord, I just pray, God, that it will be received in the intended form in which I was trying to give it. And I pray that the people here will hear it as it was intended to be heard and receive it with a humble heart and be contrite and get in the altar and get a burden for souls. Win people to Christ. Lord, before it's too late. And I know the time is short. The night is coming when no man can work. That's fastly approaching upon us, Lord. And I pray, God, that everybody in this building will do something, whatever you've called them to do, that they'll get on it and get with it and get busy in the vineyard. And let's get this thing done, Lord, so we can get on to the judgment seat of Christ and lay the things at your feet that need to be laid at your feet. And I thank you, Lord, for this congregation. I thank you for their love for your word and their love for you. And I pray, God, you'll keep them safe and keep them protected until we come together again. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you this morning. We appreciate you being here today. Be blessed. Anybody that wants to receive communion, I'm ready to give it. All right, come on, young man. All right.